So explanations should be about 29 right now. Um, breakaway. The military governor of the Igbo dominated southeast, Colonel Adum Egu Ajuku. His name is also Emika Ajuku. But I'll get into that later. Citing the northern massacres and electoral fraud proclaimed with southern parliament the secession of the southeastern region from Nigeria as the Republic of Biafra, an independent nation on May 30th, 1967, May 29th in some sources. Although there was much sympathy in Europe and elsewhere, only four countries recognized the new republic. It was also said that one of the reasons for Juku declaring the new republic of Biafra is that he did not recognize Goan as head of state because Goan was not the next officer to Ironsi in the military hierarchy. The Nigerian government immediately launched a police action used the armed forces to retake the secessionist territory. At first, Nigerian progress was slow, and failures of its larger army to invade territory of the new republic led to a growth of wide, of worldwide support for Biafra. Biafran troops led by Colonel Banjo, a brilliant tactician, crossed the Niger River, entered the Midwestern region, and launched attacks close to Lagos, then the, which back then was the Nigerian capital. However, reorganization of the Nigerian forces, the reluctance of the Biafran army to fight, and the effects of a naval land and air blockade of Biafra led to change in the balance of forces. Biafran forces were pushed back into their core territory, and the capital of Biafra, the city of Enugu, was captured by Nigerian forces. The Biafrans continued to resist in the core Igbo heartlands, which were soon surrounded by Nigerian forces. The Swedish eccentric Count Carl Gustav von Rosen also led a mini coin brigade in action. The, his, B, his BAF, Biafran Air Force, consisted of three Swedes and two Biafrans. Stalemate. Now, this is the last paragraph in it. Again, this site is Nigeria Planet. And from 1968 onward, the war fell into a lengthy stalemate with Nigerian forces unable to make significant advances into the remaining areas of Biafran control. Blockade of the surrounding Biafrans led to a humanitarian and propaganda disaster when it emerged that there was widespread civilian hunger and starvation in the besieged Igbo areas. An overused tactic of the Nigerian forces had been the sabotage of farmland, and this was now beginning to affect Biafran populations. So now you see why sabotage is especially, you know annoying to me it enrages me because that's what the the people who roll with satan and the beast and the fulani scum the traitors to god used against my people during the nigerian civil war of the late 60s now we go on and where was i okay we're talking about the sub sabotaging the farmland now this beginning to affect the biafran population images of starving biafran children went around the world biafran government claimed that Nigeria was using hunger and genocide to win the war and sought aid from the outside world. See, we are the mightiest tribes, whether you're talking about the devils or the pitchforks or lesser and leper, they resort to sabotage and trying to control the food. Because they know, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, they don't have a chance. It's like Ali versus fucking Glass Joe. Give me a fucking break. Now we go on. Many volunteer Bodies organized blockade breaking relief flights into Biafra carrying food, medicines, and sometimes weapons. Nigeria also claimed the Biafra government was hiring foreign mercenaries to extend and lengthen the war. So you see some of the Europeans who were in it for the money or some of them cared and they're in it for both, etc., etc. I have a certain amount of respect for those guys who are flying the relief flights. And that guy, I believe his name was Roswell or some Rosin. I forgot his name. He, he was a mercenary that died in the war and they took his body off the battlefield. Now, we, let me finish it now. It talks about final surrender of Biafra forces in 1970. Duke fled to the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire leaving his deputy Philip Ifong to handle the details of the surrender. Okay, now this is when he starts to boot licking. I don't want to finish it. As a matter of fact, this is the boot licking and then Oba Sancho comes in. Oh, 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 after Scorpion, after fucking the Black Scorpion, Colonel Adunkle, the fucking scumbag, rapes and kills tons of Ebos. That's what the boot lickers in this, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, you know who I'm talking about. The people who wrote, <laughs> yeah, and they left out, you know what I mean? Now, what I'm trying to get at, my friends, is Obo Sanjo is just another rich bootlicker and he needs to recognize that bootlicking to the Muslims and letting them build a fucking mass fortune of oil money and extortion from the fucking government subsidies and all that shit is not gonna fly. 
The cult of Rahor Ketty is not going to sit back and watch our enemies fucking rich roll and ball and shit and stack up a huge mass fucking army of weapons and troops and human resources and fucking artillery and all kinds of shit with their fucking Al-Qaeda network pals and the Somalian Al-Shabaab buddies giving them a little hand. You think we're just going to sit back and allow that fucking shit to fly? Need I explain more? On to the next video. Round them up! And I ain't saying it like a cowboy, neither.